So thanks so much, and thanks for sticking around until the end of the conference here. Um, yeah, so my name is Mike Ryder. I'm a professor at UNC Chapel Hill. I'll admit I probably shouldn't be giving this talk uh, because this is primarily the work of Hyben. He Hyben was um, one of my, uh, sorry, not my graduate student, my postdocs a couple of years ago. He started this work in my group and uh, completed it after leaving. And uh, both he and Cece had visa troubles to get here, so here I am. Um, but I will do my best to represent the work. Uh, it, and what this is about is asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant protocols uh, and, uh, and particularly making them efficient. So what's the backdrop here? Uh, we're concerned with client server architectures, uh, where clients, of course, invoke services to get uh, or servers to get some kind of service. And in particular, what we're concerned about is the compromise of those servers. And when this happens, of course, you can't trust what answers uh, the client is getting. And so a, a classic method to deal with this problem is something called state machine replication. It goes back before most of you, not me, but most of you were born. Um, and uh, and, and uh, the basic idea is that you replicate the service with multiple servers uh, so that uh, they collaborate in producing a response to the client. Typically, uh, well, yeah, so if, as long as a minority of the servers are compromised, the server replicas are compromised, the client can obtain the correct answer by majority vote. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now, of course, to get this to work, it's a little more complicated. Um, what you really need to do is for the correct, correct replicas to maintain consistent state. And the way that's typically done is that you start all the correct replicas in the same state, and then you make sure that operations, their responses that is computing deterministically is a function of the state and the requests that the replicas receive. And then finally, that the replicas execute operations in the same order so that they can proceed in lockstep with one another, the correct ones will anyway. Then of course, the replicas send their responses to the clients, and the client can take replica uh, responses as individual votes as to what the right answer should be. And so just to make sure that we're on the same page about this, um, and by the way, this is often called a total order requirement or atomic broadcast. Just to make sure we're on the same page about this, if we have these three replicas that each start with a balance of $100 in an account, uh, and then uh, there are a couple of requests that get ordered, say, for example, to deposit $100 and then to charge a 10% fee for some reason. As long as the correct, correct replicas deliver these two requests in the same order, they will produce the same responses and the client will be able to accept this response as the correct one, regardless of what this third correct replica does. Similarly, if these re requests get ordered in the opposite order, the, the final answer is, uh, is different. However, again, it, the, the, the faulty replica can't influence what the, that correct answer will be. In this third scenario where they get ordered differently at the different replicas, they, the, what happens to the client is a little bit unclear. Um, either it will get no response if nothing occurs in the majority. There's no response that occurs in the majority or the faulty replica can bias the answer in one way or another. And so this is what we're trying to avoid by ensuring a total order requirement on the order in which the responses are requested to get delivered to the replicas. Now, there's a few different axes along which the community has explored protocols to ensure this total order requirement. One of them is the kind of system in which all of these protocols are being run. And these typically get separated into two classes. One is asynchronous and one is partially synchronous. So in an asynchronous system, uh, there are no known bounds or there are no bounds on message transmission delays or process execution rates. You send a message, you know it will get there, but you have no idea how long it will take. A process will, a replica or a client will make progress, but you don't really know at what rate they're going to make progress. Um, and this yields protocols that are most robust to timing and denial of service attacks, because even if there was an attack that slowed the system down, the system, your protocol wasn't built using any assumptions about that, be, that performance anyway. And so it just doesn't matter. Um, on the other hand, there's an unfortunate downside, which is that there was a, f a very famous result due to Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson that showed that these protocols cannot be deterministically live in this scenario. And so what you can get is probabilistic liveness. You cannot get deterministic liveness. And the current state of the art here is something called Honey Badger BFT, which was um, proposed at this conference a couple of years ago. 
Uh, and uh, th this is sort of the latest in a line of protocols in the space for asynchronous systems. Now, there's an alternative universe called the partially synchronous systems where there exists such bounds, there, but they are unknown to the participants of the system. So the systems, sorry, th these systems are built around uh, knowing that there are these bounds, but not knowing what they are a priori. Um, this gets rid of the impossibility results, so it is possible to have deterministic total ordering in this context. Um, and this is frankly where most of the action has been in the last 20 years. If you think back to, if you've heard of B PBFT at OSDI 1999, that's an example uh, and a very prominent example of a protocol in this space. And that spurred a tremendous amount of work in partially synchronous systems since then. Um, and what one of the lessons of this kind of work has been that there really hasn't been one right answer for partially synchronous atomic broadcast protocols. Rather, you can there's a, a variety of protocols that can be tuned to different goals, but there's no one best. Um, there's also uh, a dependency on these protocols that tends to show up on something called a view change sub protocol, whereby you have to change who's currently leading the protocol if they're not being responsive enough. That ends up being a source of a lot of complexity in these protocols. And I'm gonna to return to this lesson or this issue later. But one thing I wanna leave you with for the moment is that this, these sub protocols are a location of a lot of complexity. So much so that, for example, um, there's been some recent work showing that the view change sub protocols and systems like Ziziva, if you're familiar with that one, are end up actually, they end up being wrong. And so it's a source of a lot of complexity to get this right. Now, there's another axis along which these protocols tend to get separated. Um, one of them is general Byzantine fault tolerant state machine replication versus just storage. And the big distinction here is that in a just storage system, it just supports read and write operations. You can read stuff, you can write stuff, but you can't do more interesting things with it. Whereas in a general BFT state machine replication system, you can execute arbitrary transactions against the state. In both cases, we're going to consider them basically key value storage. But again, one allows read-write operations, the other one um, allows arbitrary transactions. Okay, so with all that background, what's in this paper? Well, basically the way to think about this paper is it's starting from something like Honey Badger BFT and doing an, a, a sort of an exploration of the design space. Remember how I told you in the in the uh, in the partially synchronous system model, there's been a lot of exploration and there's a huge number of protocols and you can pick and choose different ones according to your needs. We started from Honey Badger BFT and said, look, is there one right answer for asynchronous protocols or is it a similar scenario? There's, there's a, a, a pick and choose thing where there's a lot of protocols and you have to pick and choose as to what the right thing is for your needs. And I think the lesson of this paper is that it's really the latter. So BEAT here is a family of protocols that sort of explores different elements in the design space. Um, three of them, the first three listed in this fancy table, are ge for general Byzantine fault to tolerance state machine replication. The last two, B3 and B4, are for Byzantine fault tolerance storage only. Now, you're, you'll see here a lot of, uh, you know, reference to different piece parts that I'm frankly not going to have time to tell you about. So I mentioned that these protocols have to be randomized, so they involve coin flipping. So some of these protocols work by sort of wheeling in different coin flipping protocols into the Honey Badger BFT framework. Um, there's, you'll see a mention in a few of these lines of uh, threshold encryption. Where does that come into play? Well, there's another requirement I really haven't even told you about yet that's in the Honey Badger case called censorship resistance. Elsewhere, it's called fairness, where you want to prevent faulty replicas from suppressing certain requests from getting through. So selecting ones to keep from getting through. So the idea is that you encrypt them before they get submitted into the protocol and then actually decrypt them only after um, the, they've already been ordered. So that it's kind of too late to go back and figure out which ones to selectively suppress. So that's the idea. I'm going to have to just skip out over all of that in this talk. Um, one thing I will tell you about is something uh, is erasure coding support in the context of these protocols and something called a fingerprinting cross checksum, which is one of the innovations that underlies different parts or different protocols in this space. 
But let me now back up to Honey Badger BFT and sort of give you the one slide introduction to what this thing is. Um, again, this was proposed a couple of years ago at this conference. It implements total order using something called asynchronous common subset, which has been around for, for a while. Um, but the, the key thing I want to highlight for the moment is that to implement asynchronous common subset, there are two additional protocols that are used. One of them is called Reliable Broadcast or RBC. And the other one's called asynchronous binary Byzantine agreement. So there's a phase in Honey Badger BFT where you do the reliable broadcast followed by this asynchronous binary Byzantine agreement to actually decide how to order the things that have been reliably broadcast. And I want to focus for a moment on the reliable broadcast primitive because that's sort of where the, uh, the erasure coding and the fingerprinted cross checksum stuff comes into play. So now again, I need to go back in time. Uh, to again before all of you were born uh, and you know uh, to, to talk about what reliable broadcast is. So reliable broadcast is a, is a primitive in, in things like Honey Badger BFT that guarantees two properties. There's a designated broadcaster um, that sends a message to all of the replicas, in this case, the server replicas in the system. Um, and it guarantees two properties. The first is that if any correct replica delivers a broadcast uh, message, say B, then all correct replicas will deliver it. So it's an all or nothing property. Either everyone delivers it or nobody delivers it. And moreover, if the broadcaster is correct, then every correct replica will deliver its broadcast message, okay? If it's faulty, nobody might deliver it, but if anybody does, everybody will, okay? Um, now, Broca's protocol, just like you know, a lot of the protocols in this space, including Honey Badger BFT that builds on it, uh, w tolerates uh, 3F plus 1, uh, sorry, tolerates F faults out of 3F plus 1 replicas, so a third of the system can be faulty. And to give you some sense for how this works, um, basically what happens is you start with your message B, your broadcast message, and the broadcaster, in this case P0, sends, out, sends it out to everyone. And then there's a step where, where in this case, P1 echoes the broadcast message uh, by basically resending it to everyone else. Now, there's some additional logic that I'm going to hide from you for the moment. Basically, um, you echo, in, in, to be very brief, you'll echo a message when you get it from the broadcaster or if you get T plus one, F plus one other echoes and so forth. So some other logic is that dictates when you do these things. But in the normal mode of operation, you echo a message. And in fact, everybody will echo the message. And so you see right away that you're incurring N squared times the size of the broadcast message communication complexity to do this. It turns out there's another round of it uh, called the ready messages. But of course, by the time you've already done these echoes, you've incurred this asymptotic n squared b communication complexity. Now, um, I, the, you know, traditionally, protocols in this space were developed for small numbers of replicas, right? If you go back into the 80s and 90s, we were talking about replica ensembles of maybe four or seven replicas. Today, everybody thinks in terms of blockchain, right? So permissioned blockchains are the new name for Byzantine fault tolerant, you know, foo. And so, uh, you know, when you think about blockchains, no one thinks about four or seven. They think of N as, you know, 100 or N as 200. And now you can start to see where N squared size of B becomes a problem. And so, one of the things that we wanted to do was to look at whether there are other alternatives to using this reliable broadcast primitive. In fact, Honey Badger BFT asked that question as well. And so what they chose to use was a different primitive. And they, I mean, it's still reliable broadcast, but it's implemented in a different way. It's called AVID, and it's due to Kashan and Tassaro back in 2005. And what it does, it leverages erasure coding to shrink the size of what's being sent around. Um, in particular, right, so what, what's happening here is that the, the broadcast message B is being erasure coded into fragments, in this case four fragments, or four-thirds the total size of the broadcast message B. And then off of each fragment, the broadcaster generates something called a cross checksum by hashing each fragment and then appending these four red little tiny boxes into what's called a cross checksum. 
And so what happens is that this is broadcast, each fragment and the cross checksum is broadcast out in the initial message. So the way this looks from, say, Replica 2's point of view is that in the initial message from the broadcaster, it may receive the second fragment and all of the hashes, or in other words, the cross checksum. And then it may receive in other echoes, say the third fragment along with the cross checksum and the fourth fragment along with the cross checksum. And of course, it, it makes sure that all the cross checksum values are the same. But how do you know if, the, if this is actually a correct erasure coding of a legitimate message? Well, what happens is that this replica will reconstruct the, the, the entire block, the message, because it ha now has enough fragments. And then it will re erasure code the block into the respective fragments, which is a deterministic process, recompute the cross checksum, and then compare those, the, the new cross checks and the newly generated cross checksum with the cross checksum that was being passed around. And as long as these things match, um, you know that there is agreement on, uh, on what goes on. And so now you can echo your fragment along with the cross checksum. Now, one of the things that, that gave rise directly to the, the, the work in this paper is one more piece of work uh, called AVIDFP um, that improves on this by using something called homomorphic fingerprints. Uh, this is proposed at POTSI 2007. And in brief, what happens here is that it uses erasure coding, but in instead of using a cross checksum, it, it uses the cross checksum as the output of a random oracle to seed a fingerprinting function on the different fragments. And what's interesting about these fragments is that they have the same relationship with, sorry, the, the fingerprints is that they have the same relationship amongst themselves as the fragments themselves do. And so what this means is that in the protocol, what, you, what can happen or what will happen is that say a replica receives from the broadcaster a fragment as well as the cross checksum and the fingerprints. The individual fragment can be checked against the cross checksum just by hashing, but then the fingerprints can be, you can erasure, decode the fingerprints to get all the other fingerprints. And then you can check the fragment against the fingerprint locally. And now the only thing that everyone has to send around is the cross checksum and the fingerprints and the data doesn't have to go around at all. And so this is what, this is a trick that gets you down in terms of your your um, bandwidth consumption all the way down to order size of B to broad you're actually independent of the number of replicas now in terms of the bandwidth you're uh, you're you're uh, consuming. Now one of the key ingredients in Beat is a generalization of this thing, this homomorphic fingerprinted cross checksum. In particular, um, the original Hendrix work focused on maximum distance separable codes like Reed Solomon codes, but there's a lot, been a lot of work in the uh, erasure coding domain to come up with new constructions that are more bandwidth efficient, in particular for supporting fast reads. And so one of the things that we've done in this work is to generalize the fingerprinted cross checksum work from these MDS codes to things like pyramid codes, which aren't MDS, but they allow very efficient reads, saving, for example, 50% of your read bandwidth at about 10% cost in terms of the storage in the system. I'm obviously not going to have time to tell you about how we do all this, but hopefully I've been interested in you enough in reading our paper. Uh, just to sort of um, give you a sense for some of the savings that uh, this kind of technique can give you, uh, Hyben and CC built these protocols um, and uh, uh, compared them to Honey Badger BFT as well as Honey Badger with AVID replaced by BRCA, the original broadcast protocol. And I just want to sort of put up in front of you a few of the comparisons. These things were done on Amazon EC2, uh, some of them up to 92 nodes spread across different continents. There were LAN tests that focused on uh, putting everything in one region or WAN tests that put everything in various regions. Um, here's a graph of latency. Uh, what we see here is these horizontally striped blue things are the original honey badger. And so different members of the beat family in terms of their latency are represented here in the middle. Uh, right smack dab in the middle is uh, honey badger with BRCA broadcast replacing the, uh, the underlying AVID broadcast. So the AVID broadcast costs you some latency for in exchange for some some bandwidth savings here this shows what you can regain by putting BRCA back in but then all the other other 
sort of uh, uh, bars here represent different members of the beat family. Now, beat zero, beat one, uh, are the, the red vertical and the, the diagonal black bars uh, are, are sort of more optimized for latency, whereas the others are more optimized for throughput. But you see in this case, virtually all of these improve latency over the original uh, Honey Badger. Uh, here's a, a, a different view of performance, particularly with a focus on throughput. Now, there's a lot of lines here, so I'll just sort of highlight a few of them for you. The original Honey Badger is the, the, the blue squares right in the middle, uh, looking vertically. Uh, and the, the um, uh, Honey Badger with Braca is the black triangles. Okay, so again, you, here you lose some throughput which is expected when you replace Avid with Braca. But then here you see some other, uh, the, the, you know, the other family members and how they perform. In particular, this erasure coded cross checksum trick that I described is a key element up here of beat four. And you see, not surprisingly, that you get really much better throughput using this technique versus the original uh, Honey Badger. And um, here it is in a WAN setting. Same story, just bigger numbers that or sorry i should say lower numbers because we're looking over a throughput over a wan setting but again right if you if you look at the high uh the highest curves here we're looking at members of the beat family that leverage this fingerprint across checksum and erasure coding okay um the last thing i wanted to show you just briefly is uh, some scalability numbers. So what we're doing here is we're ramping up the number of replicas. Again, thinking blockchains, lots of replicas, so on and so forth. Um, here, F is the number of faults, again, that you can tolerate. And so the number of replicas is three times this many. And what you see here is the common colors are beat three versus honey badger. Okay, so uh, the blue lines are beat three for, for a solid line and dashed for honey badger. Red lines are again, beat three and, and honey badger, uh, but just for a different F. And so what you see here is that B3 is outperforming and throughput honey badger uh, in each of these cases and scaling well. So I'm hoping that these graphs, I realize there's a lot of context behind them I'm not showing you, but I'm hoping this will excite you enough to go read the paper and understand what's actually going on in the protocols as to why this is uh, the way it is. So in terms of a few lessons, uh, I just wanted to share before we go. Um, uh, again, right, I think the way to think about this paper is that beats an exploration of the design space here. I described kind of one axis along this erasure coding axis that, that the paper covers. There are others in the paper. Um, and one lesson I think we need to draw here is that as in the partially synchronous case, it appears that in the asynchronous model, there is again a not one size fits all protocol, right? There's a range of options that you can choose from to, to optimize for different performance measures. Um, and the other thing that's nice is that these beat protocols aren't, don't have any underlying uh, view change elements. And so we get to avoid a lot of that complexity that's characteristic of a lot of the partially synchronous protocols. In case you're interested in the software, uh, Bug CC and uh, Hybin about that because they're actively building on it. They're trying to incorporate smart contract uh, technology and so forth and release it hopefully in Hyperledger. But if you're interested in playing with these, the software, please do contact them. Okay, and thank you very much. I appreciate it.